tells us that we do have a sin problem. And it's good for us from time to time to review from one angle or another the gospel. And there's a massive obstacle to people becoming uh, Christians. I was, I was discussing some of this with some people this last week as I uh, had to do a funeral for a distant relative, a uh, neighbor here in Skinall, a couple doors down, came out order and uh, passed away. And so I did that on Friday. And um, a lot of people believe that all good people go to heaven. You just automatically go. And uh, that's obviously, biblically, that's not correct. And I shared that with uh, the people that were here, the friends and the relatives for the funeral. I, I made that statement that a lot of people believe that, but that that's not true. We do have a sin problem, and there is a problem between us and God. And one of the reasons we need to review these things regularly as a Christian, even if everyone here is saved, everyone here is born again and is a Christian, that's wonderful. But this is our message. This is our message that we're supposed to take to the world. This is what we're supposed to have clarified and, and we're supposed to have honed in on and we're supposed to have uh, made sure that we got the details right and made sure that uh, we are doing what we can whenever we talk about the scriptures, talk about the gospel, talk about how a person can be saved. And this is a wonderful passage to do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And talking about a same problem, not just for unbelievers. Obviously, unbelievers go to the great white throne, but a few verses before the passage that we're going to mainly be looking at, uh, if we could look at that, in 2 Corinthians 5 and in verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In the original, that's the Bema seat. So this is this year he's talking to believers and he's talking about the judgment that believers, us, Christians are going to face whenever we stand before the Lord. We're going to be at a, at a different judgment. We'll be at the Venus of judgment. Unbelievers will be at the great white throne. It says, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what, what he has done, whether good or bad. So we can think about the gospel, and we can think about how the gospel has an effect on an unbeliever, obviously, because without the gospel and believing it, believing upon Christ, they're lost, they're not saved. But for the Christian, we ought to be able to look at the gospel, be reminded of what Jesus did for us, and feel sorry for our sin. Because we still have that. We still have sin. In our verses we're going to look at that was read for us, uh, here in chapter 5, verses 16 through 21, um, there are three very important gospel doctrines that are in this passage. Uh, the first one is the new birth. The new birth. And the second one is reconciliation. And the third one is substitutionary atonement. <clears throat> so we're going to see those as we go through here. And uh, in verses 16 and 17, we see the new birth. Verse 16, it says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. When Paul says this, he's saying that there was a time whenever we were able to walk with Jesus and uh, we could talk with Jesus and eat with him and you could touch him and you could ask him questions directly <clears throat> when he was here on the earth. But... We don't know him this way any longer. Uh, there's one of the reasons that a lot of people have trouble believing the Christian gospel is because they can't see who it is we're talking about. <laughs> uh, he lived 2,000 years ago, and now he's in, he's in heaven. And we're trying to tell people about the significance of what Jesus did when he came here uh, to this earth. And they don't get it oftentimes because they just look at the things that they can see. They don't, again, they don't see their sin problem. They don't feel, feel that they have a problem. Many young believers, they don't believe that they need to change. They don't see that need. He says here that even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, again, the disciples, they did. They, they walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They were able to do that. But for us, we know that in this way no longer. 
Uh, remember when Jesus was talking to Doubting Thomas after he rose from the dead, and he said, uh, because you've seen me, you believe? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. We're living in that time after Jesus ascended up into heaven where we, we don't see him face to face anymore this side of heaven. And for some people, that makes it hard uh, to believe. None of us have ever seen Jesus. I've, I've never seen Jesus uh, face to face. Not yet. But one day, one day, we will. And right now, what we have is the word of God. What we have is the truth of what's written and passed down to us as the written revelation of God. And we can believe because of that. Continuing in verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creature. The old things passed away, the old new things have come. There he's talking about, as I said, the new birth. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? He said, you must be born Again, if you, unless a man is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So what's described here is necessary in order for us to go to heaven. We have to have that. We have to allow God to do a work in our life by believing in His Son. And when we do genuinely, then He will cause us to be born again. We will be, as the Bible, as the doctrine is, regenerated. And that word is used for us in Titus chapter 3. It talks about our new birth. It uses the word regeneration. That we, the washing of regeneration and renewing is by the Holy Spirit. So whenever we become saved, the Holy Spirit, He comes down and He comes and He dwells in us and He causes us to be regenerated. He causes us to be born again when we truly believe and when that happens. We are adopted into God's family. We become a Christian genuinely. We can never lose our salvation and forever we are a child of God. <coughs> Secondly, we see this doctrine of reconciliation in verses 18 through 20. In verse 18 it says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself <coughs> through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This is a really important word, and we want to understand what it means. If I could give a definition, the word reconciliation, or to be reconciled, is talking about a thorough, complete change of relationship. So in other words, in our sin, before we are saved, we are living in opposition to God. We are separated from God because He is holy and we are not. We have sinned. He cannot be in the presence of sin. So we are separated from Him because of that. We are not on a path to heaven naturally without God. And so we need to be reconciled to Him. We need to be brought back into a right relationship with Him. We need to be brought near to God. In verse 18, when we see this, it's describing reconciliation. Uh, it's describing something that God has already done. If you look at it again, it says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So he has reconciled us to himself through Christ. So in a sense, God has already accomplished everything that is needed in order for us to be reconciled to God. He's already done what is necessary. We don't, he doesn't need to be reconciled to us because he's already done what he's needed to do. But something that does need to happen is we need to be reconciled to Him. Because Jesus has already accomplished what we need in order to be saved, that is one of the main reasons why we cannot work for our salvation. If we try to work for our salvation and we try to do good things, then we're not really accomplishing anything because, in a sense, God has already accomplished everything that needs to happen in order for us to be saved. Uh, every religion in the world, besides true Christianity, is a works religion. It doesn't matter what it is, they're all works religions because that's how man naturally thinks. You feel like you have to compensate for the fact that you've been bad and that you've been sinful. And so you try to do this and you try to do that and you try to you know, make the scales balance out that it doesn't work. And so all these false religions, they're influenced by, by demons obviously and they, they, they've been thought up in the mind of men. 
and it doesn't matter what it is, they're all works religions. Uh, I, I know people from different faiths that I've talked to, and um, uh, they, as I talk to them, it's obvious that it's, they believe in a, Christian, in a, uh, a works religion. Uh, some Jehovah's Witness people, uh, they have to keep doing these things, they have to do this, do that, do this, do that. Mormons, they believe in a works religion. Uh, Muslims, they believe in a works religion. All religions, besides true Christianity, is a works religion. And when I say that, I mean that they have to work in order to obtain what they're after, that eternal life, that, that heavenly reward. That's what makes it a works works religion. But really, most people are not trying to work to get to heaven. Uh, I think if people really were honest and you talk to them and the average person on the street, they're not trying to work in order to get to heaven. Most people, I think, are just trying to live, live their lives. And when you try to tell them that they're a sinner and that they need to be reconciled to God, it, they, don't, they don't like that because that means you're, in their eyes, you're creating a problem that didn't exist to start with. But that's part of our mission is to help people understand that that problem is there. That problem is real. It does exist. And they are going to have to stand before God someday. I believe in our society we're living in a culture that is just like what it was like uh, during the time of the judges. When it said that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, that's the way people live. People just kind of live the way they, uh, the way they want to. The funeral that we had on Friday for Gaynell was really nice and I had a great time spending time with the immediate family. I mean, I'm, I'm extended family, turns out, <laughs> with, with them. But as I pointed out at the funeral, pretty much everyone in this area is related to some extent. You know, obviously we can go all the way back to Adam, but in this county, I mean, wow, we're all related pretty much. Um, and so uh, Gaynell, she was a, a distant relative of mine. So it was nice that I was able to, to take care of her service. Um, but I've heard of funerals that really, I would be hard for me to do one of the, the funeral like some of the ones that I've heard of before. I've heard of funerals where people, uh, because the person liked to drink, you know, they, they had a party at the funeral. They just got, everyone got drunk in the after service and that kind of thing. I've heard of uh, uh, funerals where people take lottery tickets, you know, you put certain things on the casket with the person, put, some, put a lottery ticket with them because they like to play the lottery. And, you know, it's hard. It would be hard, I imagine, for me, you know, if things like that were happening, what do you say when you get up, when you get up to speak, right? Um, but every man is one to live in a way that is right in his own eyes. But the fact is that we can't just continue to live the way that most people do and expect God to be pleased with us. We need to be reconciled to God. We need to be brought into a right relationship with God. And in verse 18, it talks as though uh, this has already been accomplished through Jesus Christ and what He has done. And we have this message. It's, this is a, the ministry that we have is the ministry of reconciliation. But just because Jesus accomplished what He did on the cross doesn't mean that everyone is going to go to heaven. And the reason is verse 20. In verse 20, we see the human responsibility. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you, look at this language, we beseech you, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. There is this responsibility that we all have. We can't just assume that everyone's going to go to heaven and that relatives especially, we don't want to think ill of relatives, but we think of our cousins and our relatives, you know, your grandkids and uh, brothers, sisters, parents, whoever, it doesn't matter if it's your family, obviously you don't want to think ill of them. But it's terrible to think of a person assuming that they're going to go to heaven and for them to really not. That's terrible. There's this human responsibility that we have, and that even though Jesus took care of the penalty for our sin on the cross, now, now, we need to do something. We need to be reconciled to God. As believers, as I already said, as believers, we have sin in our lives still, and that's obvious. I mean, the more time goes on, it's true. I, I catch myself in sin, right? I mean, do you? Be honest, right? I catch myself in sin, and the more time goes on, I notice more sin. <laughs> you know, uh, the more I learn 
about Scripture and learn about God, the more time goes on, the more time I have to reflect on my own life, the more time I have to kind of go through my daily business, I see sin in my life more and more. And really, that's the way it should be. The closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to God, the more we should see our own sin in our lives. And that needs to be corrected. That needs to be corrected, obviously. Christians aren't people who think that they're perfect, like many people believe. Instead, Christians are people who know they are not. We have to understand that whenever, if we are going to become saved, we need to see our own sin. And a Christian is a person who has come to know that all too well. We all see our sin. Each and every day we see our sin. We deserve God's punishment because of our sin. And because of things that I still have in my life that I'm working on, I keep, you know, every one of us has weaknesses and things. I notice things in my life. There's a sin in my life. I look and I see, oh, look, there's another sin. I haven't even noticed that one before. And we got to remind ourselves that whenever we sin those sins, that has caused Jesus to need to be nailed to the cross. The penalty for those things that we do are that Jesus is nailed to the cross. And we crucify him all over again when we continue to let those things reign in our lives without asking God to forgive us. Because he, that is what he had to do. He had to go to the cross. A Christian is a person who agonizes over knowing that that sin is in their life and that it cost Jesus to hang on the cross. And so because of that, because of sin, mankind needs to be reconciled to God. Now finally, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And here we have the third doctrine, salvation doctrine in this passage. Substitutionary atonement. That means that Jesus, when he went to that cross, he took our sin upon himself. He took our sin and he bore it upon himself on that cross so that he could bear the penalty for that sin. He took our sin upon himself, it says, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And it's, again, because of that, he's accomplished it. And if we just believe in him, then we will be reconciled to God. And when we believe, then his righteousness is applied to our account. When I think about sin, whether it's for a, a non-believer or for a believer, I was studying this passage, and I couldn't stop thinking about the prodigal son, where Jesus described this man who had two sons, and that the one he wanted his inheritance, remember, and so he gave him his inheritance early, and it wasn't too long before he ran off, and he started spending it all, and he squandered it all off in the world, and he used it all up, and it wasn't too long before he had no money left to it. He was just living a life of sin. And until he realized that he was in a predicament that was so bad that he was worse off than even his dad's servants. And so he went back to his father and he was, he, was, he was ready to just tell his dad to just make him like one of his servants so that he could come back and so that he could have something to eat. And uh, when he went back, he didn't expect it, but his dad received him and threw a party for him. And he was reconciled. His relationship to his dad was reconciled because he went back to him. And he realized the sloth that he had ended up in. And when he did that, of course, the story tells us uh, that the, his brother was upset about that <laughs> because he had gone off and squandered his inheritance and, and yet his dad threw a party for him. But his dad received him back because he had come back and he, had, he was sorry for what he had done. He had come back and he wanted a restored relationship with his dad. He wanted to be reconciled. And so he was. He was totally reconciled to his dad. We can have that with God. We can be reconciled to God. I want to finish with a, a passage in Romans. If you would turn with me to Romans chapter 5, please. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Romans 5 and verse 9. It says, Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation, or the atonement, as some translations put it. So we can be reconciled to God. We can be reconciled to God in our salvation, brought into a right relationship with Him, but we still have sin in our life as a Christian, so we need to be continuing to ask God to forgive us, to be, to be as Pastor Jim says, we keep short accounts with the Lord, and we need to be able to see our sin and to admit that that's in our life to the Lord and call it what He calls it and ask Him for forgiveness. Obviously, everyone in the world is going to die one day. It's appointed unto man wants to die. And if we're a believer, then we're going to the beam of seat judgment. But if the person is an unbeliever, then they go to the great white throne. And the only thing that determines which judgment we are at is have we been reconciled to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this familiar passage. I just pray, Lord, that you would help us again in this week. That you would give us opportunities, not just opportunities, but the boldness to share this message with the world. I pray, Lord, that you would help these words that we've read from your word to sink down deep into our hearts this week. In Jesus' name I pray. To close our service for today, we're going to...